Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to tell you about quantum complexity of clique homology. So um, to begin with the, the punchline, I'm going to try and convince you that this classical problem, which arises in topology, has secretly quantum, mecha quantum mechanical structure. And this, you know, when we see this sort of quantum mechanical structure in classical problems, it's interesting because you can then look for it as an application of quantum computers, um, which can exploit this structure. So in particular, what is the actual formal statement that we'll make is we'll say that given a description of a space, of a discrete topological space and a dimension uh, K, decide if it has a K dimensional hull or if it does not. And this problem, it will turn out, is um, inside QMA and it's QMA one hard. And so QMA one is sort of the version of QMA where you uh, have perfect completeness. So you should think of them as not that different. So if you're sandwiched between these two classes, that sort of is a compelling evidence that there is sort of a quantum mechanical uh, story to this problem. So um, why should we be interested? Well, um, you know, over the last few years, people have looked a lot at this quantum algorithm for topological data analysis. And a question you can ask is, is it possible to dequantize this algorithm? So is, is this um, quantum TDA algorithm really doing something non-trivial? And uh, so this is just sort of going back to the point, we, we like it when we can find classical problems that we, can, that we care about, which have quantum mechanical structure, which we can exploit in quantum algorithms. A, a big example of this is the hidden subgroup problem, which uh, you know, in hindsight is the underlying mechanism of Shaw's algorithm. And this you can see as being related to the quantum Fourier transform, which is something that is efficient, efficient to do on a quantum computer. Another example is the Jones polynomial, which um, you know, in the 2000s was studied and uh, became a BQP complete uh, problem. That, um, and this can be seen as a relationship between the Jones polynomial and topological quantum field theory, which is uh, to do with sort of braiding these anions, et cetera. So I'd like to convince you that this um, homology topic is a new example of this. It's a new example where we see uh, a relation to some version of quantum mechanics. And in this, particular instance, it will be supersymmetry that uh, homology will, will correspond to. Okay, so what is topological data analysis? We'd like to study the um, topology of some data set. So suppose you're given the data set as a, as a bunch of points in space. How can we define the topology of this, of this data set? So what we could do is we could um, you know, connect points that are nearby, right? So if points are within some Radius, you draw an edge, and this gives you some graph. But a graph is still not a topological object. Because, um, you know, if you're like an ant on a graph, you can only move in one direction. So we'd like to sort of build a higher dimensional discrete manifold. And uh, the object that we're looking for is known as a simplicial complex. So how do we build a simplicial complex from this graph? Well, every um, clique we declare it to be a simplex. So the K simplices will correspond to the K plus one cliques. For example, if I have a triangle, I'll sort of color that triangle in and it will become a solid two dimensional edge. If I have a you know, clique of four vertices, I'll sort of fill it up with water or something and it will become like a solid uh, tetrahedron, so on in higher dimensions. Okay, and then we can begin to define the homology, which I should have said is a type of topology which studies sort of holes of various dimensions in the space. So, um, you know, we defined these cave simplices before, and if you take their span, so you just say, take linear combinations over complex numbers, we get these Hilbert spaces, these chain spaces. And then between the chain spaces are these boundary maps. By the way, this slide is sort of like a single slide introduction to um, you know, homology. So uh, it's a bit fast, but... Um, and then the boundary maps, you know, I won't define them formally, but I'll just say, you know, what do they do? They, they take a, 
a combination of simplices and act on it and then um, output the boundary, which is one dimension lower, right? So this triangle, if you take the boundary, you'll sort of get the sum over the, the, the edges that go around this triangle. And then sort of a fundamental fact about the universe is that if you take the boundary of a boundary, you get nothing. So boundaries don't have any boundaries, right? If I have like a sort of blob of matter and then I take its boundary, it's like a hollow sphere, which doesn't have any perimeter, right? Or if I take a loop of string and I take its boundary, um, or if I take a disk, sorry, and I take its boundary, I get some loop, which doesn't have endpoints, right? So this is a sort of fundamental property. So that sort of tells you that the kernel of the boundary map is, um, or the image of the boundary map from above is contained in the kernel of the boundary map going down, right? That's sort of just um, rephrasing this, this uh, boundaries have no boundaries. But then you can ask, you know, are these things equal? And then this is how we define homology. So we define homology to be the extent to which these two spaces are not equal. So we're saying that a whole is something where uh, it's something with no boundary, which is not the boundary of anything. So like a hollow sphere, right, doesn't have any perimeter, but it also has no inside, right? So it's not the boundary of the inside. Same like a loop is sort of uh, doesn't have endpoints, but it's not the boundary of any disk that's inside the, the, the loop. So those things are the holes that we're, we're trying to look at. Okay, so now that we've defined homology, we can ask, you know, given a graph, and if we build the simplicial complex in this way, decide if, um, you know, and given also a K, a dimension K, decide if this graph has a K-dimensional hole in the, in the previous sense or not. And we can ask, what is the computational complexity of this as a computational problem? Okay, so the first thing you realize is that this problem is not obviously inside NP. So why is that? That's because how would I prove to you that a space has a hole? Well, I would like to sort of give you the hole and you can check that it's a valid hole. But how many simplices does this you know, complex have? Well, um, you know, the number of simplices, so the dimension of this sort of space is equal to, yeah, so the dimension of the space is equal to the number of simplices. And that could be as large as something like n choose k, or I guess n choose k plus one to be exact. So if k is very large, say k is growing with n, this could be an exponential dimensional uh, vector space. So it's not even uh, you know, possible to succinctly describe a vector in this vector space. So that sort of is the first place where we start to see quantum mechanics appear because this chain space in which the homology lives is actually an exponential dimensional Hilbert space. So we'd like to make this link to quantum mechanics even stronger. And the way we can do that is to define this Laplacian operator, which is a self-adjoint operator on this Hilbert space. And it turns out that the, the, the kernel of this operator, it's, it's a PSD operator, and the kernel is going to be isomorphic to the, the homology that we're, that we're wondering about. So it's a sort of succinct uh, exponential dimensional matrix that we have succinct access to from the, from the graph. Um, and just to sort of whiz over what this uh, Laplacian is, it's defined in terms of boundary operators like this. And you know, there's sort of a one line proof that the kernel of this uh, operator, I mean, it's sort of manifestly PSD. If you look at it, it's like a matrix times its inverse. Um, and then the one line proof is that if I take the energy of a state, I get the norm of the boundary plus the norm of the um, adjoint of the boundary from above. So in order for this to be zero, both of these terms have to be zero. So I need to be in the kernel and I also need to be orthogonal to the image of the one from above. So I realized that was fast, but um, yeah. Right, so we're asking about the ground space now of this, uh, of this Laplacian operator. We sort of rephrased the question of, is there a hole in terms of things that look more quantum mechanical. Uh, there's not really a notion of 
locality. There's no tensor product structure here, right? The Hilbert space is like a um, span of the cliques in this graph. Okay, so now we can refine the question a little bit. Uh, yes. Okay, we can refine the question a little bit and say, okay, um, we can define this gap to keep commodity. So in the yes case, there is a k-dimensional hole, and in the no case, there's no hole, and there's not even something that's close to a hole. So the way that we can sort of formalize that is we say that this Laplacian doesn't have any exponentially small eigenvalues. All of its eigenvalues are at least one over polynomial in, in the size of the graph, the number of vertices of the graph. So n is the number of vertices of the graph. So this, this is a small graph. This is the input to the problem, right? It's not some large graph. Yes, that's right. Okay, so we can sort of immediately see that this version of the problem is inside QMA. Why is that? Because it's an instance of the local Hamiltonian problem. Right. How would I solve it using QMA? I would ask for the thing that's in the kernel. Right. In, in the case that it has a k-dimensional hole, then this Laplacian has a zero eigenvalue. I can ask for this vector in the kernel, and I can do phase estimation on the Laplacian to check that its energy is zero. Right. So that sort of is the easy direction. Right, but it's... a. Uh, I have efficient sparse access to this. Yeah. Okay, so the, the sort of work to do is that this uh, gap clique homology problem is also, in fact, QMA one hard. And this is now convincing evidence that this is really, there's something quantum mechanical in this problem. Uh, maybe I'll come back to that uh, at the end. Yeah. Okay, so just a brief. Um, uh, interlude just to say that there's a correspondence between homology and supersymmetry. So um, I guess I'll just go fast through the slide and if the words mean something to you, then you can take something away, but if not, then it's okay. But um, yeah, these are sort of the objects and um, what they correspond to through this, through this duality. Okay. So coming back to um, the question we asked at the beginning, you know, is this quantum TDA algorithm really doing something quantum or can we find a dequantization? So, you know, what this, how this works is that it exploits the ability to perform phase estimation on this Laplacian operator. That's sort of the underlying essence of this quantum TDA algorithm. So, um, you know, if the minimum eigenvalue problem on this Laplacian is QMA one hard, that sort of tells us that this Laplacian doesn't possess any sort of exploitable, classically exploitable structure that um, you know, we can use to, to, to dequantize um, the Laplacian. It's sort of, um, it can encode the most general sort of quantum um, Hamiltonians. So I would say, I mean, it's not a proof, but it's significant evidence that this quantum TD algorithm has no dequantization. Okay, so I guess I have eight minutes left or something. So I'll just, um, right. So I'd like to tell you about the hardness construction. How do we show that this thing is QMA hard? So we'd like to reduce from the local Hamiltonian problem. Um, and we'll actually reduce from this version where we have a sum of projectors onto you know, rank one states. And in the yes case, the ground energy is zero. And in the no case, it's one over poly. And then we'd like to, from the reduction, get a graph and a dimension such that if the original Hamiltonian had a zero eigenvalue, then the graph has a k-dimensional hole. And if the ground energy was bigger than one over poly, then uh, this Laplacian has an energy bigger than one over poly. Okay, so how do we encode a local Hamiltonian in the topology of a graph? So this is the one qubit graph with the zero Hamiltonian. So it's like a sort of bow tie and it has two loops. The left loop is associated to the zero state and the right loop is associated to the one state. This is how we encode a single qubit. So how could I impose, how could I, uh, you know, for example, as a first case, implement the projector onto the zero state? Well, if I have a Hamiltonian which projects onto the zero state, I'd like to remove the zero state from the homology. So I can do that by adding another vertex and connecting them up 
And then these become triangles and they get filled in. And I've sort of put a disk over the zero state, right? By the way, why these squares? That's because if, if they are triangles, I would be forced to automatically sort of color them in by the way I defined this. Um, leaving only the one state, right? So now I've sort of applied energy to the zero state. I've lifted it out of the homology and there's only the one state left. Okay, so that's a very simple, you know, projector, projection of the zero state. What about the uh, minus state? Well, there I'd like to also glue in a two-dimensional disk whose boundary is the state I'm projecting. So um, it's hard to sort of see what's going on here, but you can sort of imagine just taking a disk and gluing its boundary around the minus state, which is tracing out the zero loop and then the one loop. And then uh, it turns out that this, this is sort of like a macaroni noodle kind of, kind of thing, right? I can sort of go like, there's like a hole I can go through. So it has still one hole and that hole corresponds to the plus state. Okay, so this is how we implement projectors. And that's all I'll say about that. So now I need to tell you, how do we move to two qubits and three qubits? So for that, we'll need a notion of tensor product. If I have two graphs, the version of tensor product is that I connect these graphs all to all. So I put them side by side and I connect them all to all. This implements the tensor product on the chain complexes uh, that's sort of defined by this Kunef formula, if people have heard of that. I think it comes up in error correction quite a lot, actually. Um, right, so the n qubit graph will be the, the n fold join, this operation is called a join where you connect these graphs all to all of the single qubit graph. So for example, the two qubit graph, I've got two one qubit graphs here and I've connected them all to all. And then you can sort of see the four two qubit states as the joins of the various loops. Okay. So I'm gonna keep pushing on because I think that the uh, interesting part is this spectral sequence proof technique. So I really wanna sort of get to that. I realize this is a lot to, you know, take in, but okay. So once we've done, once we've made this construction, this is some big graph, which encodes the Hamiltonian, we'll then want to control the spectrum of the Laplace. This is the difficult part, right? We need to show that the minimum eigenvalue in the no case is, is bounded away from zero. So in order to do this, we'll weight the vertices of the things that we glued in, right? So there's this qubit graph, which was empty. And then we glued in all of these projectors onto various terms. Everything we glue in, we, sh we will weight by some small uh, perturbative constant lambda, which will be sort of one over poly scaling. Now, uh, this doesn't change the topology, but it does change the Laplacian. And what it means is that these sort of gadgets, these projectors act perturbatively on the original qubit Laplacian, which lets us sort of analyze the spectrum. But then that's still, you know, a difficult task. But um, it turns out that there's this uh, tool from algebraic topology, which makes this actually tractable. And this tool is known as spectral sequences. So let me try and explain what's going on here. So um, in a lot of sort of QMA hardness proofs, what happens is that there's some, you know, strong Hamiltonian, and then there's like a weak perturbation. And uh, I guess, um, you know, people like Toby Cubit worked on this a lot, and they, they, they call them like perturbative gadgets, right? You sort of have an effective Hamiltonian in the low energy subspace, and this allows you to prove QMA hardness of various models. This is sort of what people were doing in Hamiltonian complexity for the last uh, 10 years or so, or whatever. Um, we want to do a similar thing here. We want to say we have this original graph, which has, it's sort of like, you can imagine like a Swiss cheese, right? It has like two to the N many high dimensional holes, right? Which correspond to all the computational basis states. And then we'll implement these gadgets, which project onto various terms in the Hamiltonian. And then we want to analyze the spectrum of the Laplacian of this complex in, in the same manner. Uh, with this weighting of the vertices. But if you, if you want to do uh, you know, perturbation theory on this object, this turns out to be you know, way too difficult. 
we need to go to like very high orders in perturbation theory. But the spectral sequence machinery allows us to do this. So, um, you know, maybe I'll just sort of give a flavor for how this works. So, um, from this weighting of the vertices, we get something called a filtration in algebraic topology. And when you have a filtration of a chain complex, this allows you to write down a spectral sequence, which is a sequence of um, 2D arrays of spaces, right? So in fact, this is page zero, one, two, three, and this will go up to infinity. And each page is a two dimensional array of vector spaces. <laughs> so there's like quite a lot of vector spaces here, but um, the way to get to the next page is that you take the homology of the previous page in a certain sense. And the boundary map sort of become more and more skewed. So you sort of iteratively take the homology again and again and again, and this allows you to generate the next page from the previous page. And then what, uh, if you read this paper by Robin Foreman from 95 very carefully, um, what it tells you is that these pages of the spectral sequence are exactly what we're looking for. These form the perturbative expansion of the ground space of the Laplacian. So, you know, in order to understand the perturbation theory of this Laplacian operator, you can use this machinery. And uh, it's, it's very simple. In fact, like the, the zeroth page is the, you know, zeroth order perturbation theory. The first page is the first order perturbation theory. The second page is the second order perturbation theory, et cetera. So, you know, this spectral sequence machinery, machinery sort of plays the role of uh, a very, um, you know, convenient perturbative theory of, of, uh, of, these, of these Laplacians. Okay, so with that, I'll conclude. Um, the main takeaway, if, you know, you didn't understand any of the spectral sequence stuff, which I don't blame you, um, is that this Laplacian is a sparse matrix, but it's very large, but we have efficient sparse access to it from the description of the space. So this is a very good thing for quantum algorithms, right? Or for in general for like uh, finding quantum mechanical structure in, in, in these problems. Um, and then of course the Laplacian encodes some topology that, that, that we care about. And uh, you know, it's related to this supersymmetric uh, supersymmetry quantum mechanics. And then, so the last uh, point I have here is sort of inspired by um, uh, my advisor, Thomas Biddick, who really likes quantum PCP conjecture. So um, it's sort of interesting that there's this discrete graph problem that is QMA hard because, you know, how did we prove the classical PCP? We sort of had these gadgets which amplified the gap of various uh, sort of, you know, uh, MP hard graphs. So, you know, very tentatively if a direction is, can we do gap amplification on, on these sorts of, uh, on these sorts of things? Um, okay, thanks very much.